Good morning, my dear student. Uh, today, I'll just try to uh, continue my uh, the last previous lectures uh, when I'm when I talked about the dental plaque and the biofilms and uh, certain concern and just uh, principles of the dental plaque uh, uh, the last time. But this one, I just try to explain the microbiological specificity of periodontal disease of the dental plaque in relation with the host. But uh, by explaining uh, through the explanation of uh, plaque hypothesis, uh, various hypothesis was originated uh, from the from the uh, very uh, previous time of uh, to the plaque description until now. So I'll just try to clarify those uh, specific uh, hypotheses and the meaning of uh, uh, plaque compositions and in relation to the gingival inflammation with the host. The dental plaque uh, uh, first described as a very thin white to yellowish uh, layers uh, covering the uh, dental surfaces and other oral heart structures and even soft tissue uh, anatomical uh, structures. <clears throat> this uh, white to yellowish uh, soft layer was uh, firstly described by the pioneer of the microbiology in the uh, 17th century in 1684 by Van uh, Luke, when he described that those uh, first thin layer that cover and just try to accumulate, uh, 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 accumulated on the two surfaces, uh, it relates to the uh, certain signs of inflammation of the uh, gingival uh, tissues. But without uh, giving uh, to more details about the, of course, at that time, to the uh, components of the dental plaque and the uh, how the diagnosis was made. Uh, at that time of this uh, pathological layer. So he just uh, uh, generally described that this layer uh, is exist, and when it exists, there are certain signs of inflammation uh, accompany uh, that uh, layer. Then uh, first, the, uh, the, 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 uh, several theories actually uh, were originated uh, at the time uh, after 17th century, especially in 19th century, till now, try to explain uh, what uh, the, the this layer uh, composed of uh, try to explain the composition of this first layer uh, accumulate on the sticks on the two surfaces uh, on this uh, on the origin uh, on all the related uh, signs of inflammation uh, concerning the periodontal inflammation uh, gingivitis and uh, periodontitis afterward. And uh, also before that, I tried to relate this dental plot to the dental infections, I mean dental caries. Uh, spe specifically, uh, the first theories that was originated, when, when originated, as I'm going now to say and describe this plot hypothesis uh, about dental and then moved or jumped to the periodontal one. So the first one uh, came to uh, try to explain this uh, effect of the plaque to the uh, gingival inflammation uh, scores about traditional non-specific plaque hypothesis. Uh, very uh, simply, I'm, I'm trying to explain that later, but now just try, uh, very uh, shortly and uh, briefly uh, explaining this hypothesis. It's about the plaque quantity. So whenever we have a large amount of a plaque, in a proportional way, it will lead to uh, uh, generate the larger scales of inflammation, of gingival inflammation. So just like non-specifically cause that inflammation because of the quantity. Then the specific plaque hypothesis, uh, it's about the quality. It says that there is certain uh, plaque uh, uh, available at that surfaces leading to the inflammation. It's not about the quantity, but it's about the quality of that plaque. Uh, this is according to the uh, presence of certain specific microorganisms. The updated non-specific plaque hypothesis is try to mix the quantity and the quality and change the uh, understanding of the previous hypothesis. Uh, it's about mostly about the indigenous microorganisms that is already already uh, exists there, uh, but when it presents in the certain quantity, that's the quality of the indigenous one will lead and shift to cause a disease. Uh, in 1986 by Taylor. Then the first revolutionary uh, hypothesis comes in, in action and try uh, to change everything in terms of to understand the mechanisms actually is not just to try to describe the effect of a plaque on the uh, presental information, 
but the um, Philip Marsh in 1994 just came to uh, explain the influence of the environment on the ecosystem uh, to the uh, to the composition of the plaque and how the composition of the plaque was changed uh, to uh, to be pathogenic or virulent one because the effect of the economy uh, the ecological sorry then the last one in uh, 2009 12 uh, the very uh, latest and recent hypothesis uh, very uh, huge and revolutionary and really a uh, very uh, a great influence uh, hypothesis i just uh, consider that try to uh, depends on the previous hypothesis but uh, tries to uh, explain the uh, more specifically at the mechanistic molecular level uh, why how how this plant composition really affecting the periodontal influence by the presence of certain virulent low abundant microbiological species and this is a great job uh, was originated by uh, George Hutchinson Gallis and Michael Curtis and uh, Michael DiRapio shared uh, thoughts together just to originate this theory uh, about the dysbiosis of the normal commensal microbiota and its effect on the uh, jaw and gingival inflammation. Uh, here we, in some, uh, we have some uh, informations. I just want to talk to you about uh, talk about the it, it, uh, every uh, uh, theory in in, uh, in a specific. So the first one, traditional non-specific plaque hypothesis, uh, actually is part of the controversy that took place for over a century by Miller in 1890, Luce and uh, Taylor in 1986. And uh, the first uh, was originated uh, to, uh, and implemented actually when it describes the effect of the plaque on the dental infections, I mean dental caries. Uh, so the dental infections, they just describe it as it's caused by the non-specific overgrowth of all bacteria and dental plaque. So again, it's about the quantity. So whenever we have a large amount of dental plaque, we have a, a, a broad scales of the dental infection uh, 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 everywhere uh, to the involved area about the little plug. So the quantity again is this mind at the pathogenicity of all discriminating between the level of the virulence of the bacteria without uh, uh, describing whether those bacteria are virulent or pathogenic and non pathogenic or not. Believing this, uh, uh, the host uh, has the ability, uh, has the threshold ability to detoxifying. For example, so when this plaque uh, exists in a small number, the host ability has a lot of the acid tolerance enzymes that could uh, 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 neutralize this effect of the uh, uh, small amount of the plaque, especially with those neutralizing enzymes exist in saliva. So, but this ability to detoxifying uh, just is, was paralyzed when the amount of the plaque is beyond or larger than the level of uh, detoxifying ability of the host. So uh, the host uh, can has an effect actually to neutralizing depends on the quantity of the plug. I mean, this explanation is according to that theory at that time. And the best way of disease is non-specifically by prevention, uh, the accumulation of those plug, uh, simply by mechanical removing of uh, a much a plug as possible by tooth brushing or tooth picking. But there's certain uh, uh, limitation, uh, sorry, sorry, contradiction to this theory uh, uh, leads to abandoning the non-specific plug hypothesis. For example, a certain amount of uh, amount of plug, calculus, and gingivitis never develop periodontitis. So if they if their claiming uh, was true, it's because it depends on the quantity. This uh, should uh, this whole process could uh, originally leading to the sequential development of the disease status between the plaque, gingivitis, and periodontitis. But a lot of people just like remain with gingivitis for a whole lifetime without progressing of the periodontitis. So this is uh, contradict the understanding of this theory. Also, periodontitis. The patients have periodontitis sites demonstrating a, a considerable site specificity in the pattern of the disease. A lot of the patients has a periodontitis, for example, or upon one tooth, two teeth, or certain segments without the involvement of the whole uh, oral cavity because the amount of the plaque. So if they claim the amount of plaque uh, 
uh, exist everywhere in the oral cavity, for example. So this will lead to gingivitis everywhere and the peritonitis everywhere. But in fact, those people have the peritonitis site are certain sites. And also the improvement of technique to isolate the iron and identify the bacteria in the mid 20th century, especially the introduction of the culturing technique and the microscopy uh, to isolate certain uh, pathogenic microorganisms within the plug, leading to uh, abundant the uh, the understanding of this non-specific plaque hypothesis. So this will lead to the abandoning of the non-specific plaque hypothesis according to this contradiction. After that, there's a, there was a specific plaque hypothesis that stated that a certain plaque is pathogenic. Not all of the plaque necessarily mean that it will affecting uh, the uh, the whole situation are leading to the disease at that site. And its pathogenicity depends on the presence of an increasing and specific virulent, specific uh, pathogenic microorganisms. So in 1970, uh, based on the specific disease-related microorganisms, and as I said, uh, one of the uh, one of the points that leading to the abundance of the previous hypothesis was, was the introduction of the culture-based technique. So the culture-based technique leading to uh, encourage uh, the understanding of this specific plaque hypothesis because it's leading to the isolation of the new uh, uh, microbial species. But again, firstly applied on the study of the specific plaque uh, on the etiology of dental caries. At that time, uh, uh, nothing about the, uh, uh, the understanding of the specific plaque hypothesis could implement it on the periodontal disease. But because as I'm saying, uh, first, they try to uh, study on the, the effect of the plaque on the dental caries and all of the points related to that point, and then uh, was shifted to implement it and uh, to study the relation of that, that plaque to the periodontal disease. So uh, when it first applied to the studying the effect of this plaque in the etiology of dental caries, actually, uh, because of the uh, understanding of the specificity of this hypothesis, following the antibiotic treatment canamycin. So canamycin did to kill a certain amount of uh, uh, microbial species found within the dental plaque and the whole dental plaque was ab uh, abrupted and uh, the disease was stopped. So the effect of the antibiotic here uh, leading uh, to, the, uh, to, to stop certain micro specific uh, periodontal pathogen, uh, sorry, uh, dental pathogen and the dental caries was stopped. So to give good explanation and the reduction of the caries against all cyclococci, for example, special cyclococcus mutants. But again, there are certain there were certain certain limitations have rise at that time. Uh, for example, the canamycin cannot reach all the bacteria and uh, Some, for example, in some cases they found that the caries even exist or increased uh, following using this canamycin antibiotic because canamycin cannot uh, lead to the whole of, of the uh, microbial uh, uh, species with the found in the dental plaque. And this meaning, if you remember uh, my previous lectures when I talked about the antimicrobial resistance found in the dental plaque, and this is one of the strategies that the microorganisms, why they like to live or just to survive within the dental plaque community, because the resistance of this uh, uh, microbial, polymicrobial interactions uh, was really, really greater than if the microorganisms found in the planktonic state, or, I mean, in the free uh, modular state. So uh, the antimicrobials, uh, when they use canamycin, is not reach all the layers of the plaque uh, uh, microorganisms, maybe even just the certain level, uh, certain levels or certain layers, sorry, uh, was affected, but the other was not. Also, the disease is reversible, as the use of antibiotic was stopped, they found even when they use the stopping the when they stopped the use of antibiotic, without the need of the antibiotic uh, uh, assistance, the disease is reversible. Okay, so they discovered that those microbiota, part of those specific microbiota, uh, was originally uh, indigenous and it's part of the common cell community, and they now don't need the antibiotic uh, to kill them. And also, uh, the long-term use uh, uh, leading to the bacterial resistance, and we know the problem of antibiotic nowadays, uh, the use of this antibiotic was so limited uh, uh, because of certain points, uh, including the bacterial resistance. 
all of these findings suggested that those bacteria, as I've said, uh, are part of the indigenous ecosystem and cannot be removed. In the late 1917 to the mid 1918, the specific plaque hypothesis uh, was applied in the study of the periodontal pathogen and periodontal disease, especially uh, following the introduction of the anaerobic code uh, to isolate the anaerobic microbial periodontal pathogens. Again, antibiotic was used again to uh, effective in periodontal therapy, but not booked significant success because uh, uh, their limitations. Following a specific block hypothesis, number of the specific period pathogen was identified because of this uh, theory, but has limitation, okay, because of the uncultivable species. Uh, what I'm saying, uncultivable species, they, uh, uh, these bacteria cannot uh, culture on the uh, culturing technique because uh, the, uh, their environmental isolation conditions was very, very difficult. So uh, they by checkboard DNA, DNA checkboard uh, hybridization, they found that those uh, spe species was uh, were exist. But uh, in reality, the cultivation is so, uh, so important. So it's about uh, nearly about 50% of this uh, uh, specific present pathogen. So the bios always going toward the cultivable one. Okay. So uh, the specific part, uh, periodontal pathogen, when, we, when they identify them, they just identify them according to the cultivable one, but not about the uncultivable species. And this is one of the limitations, actually, of the specific periodontal pathogen. These findings give rise that oral diseases are initiated by a number of specific pathogens. And uh, within the next decades, uh, this uh, uh, led to the development of the what a very famous complexes in the periodontology departments. We have these books, complexes, uh, periodontitis, uh, to understand the periodontal pathogen according to their virulence and according to their communities at different levels. After that, the updated non-specific plaque hypothesis, uh, from its name, it's updated. So it means that the non-specific, again, it comes about the quantity, but here there is a new updated understanding to that uh, theory. It claims that all bacteria in the plaque contribute to the variance of the macroflora by having a role in either colonization, evasion of the defense mechanisms, and or provocation of the inflammation of tissue destructions. So any microbial colonization of sufficient quantity in the gingival crevice, okay, causes at least uh, a gingivitis causing at least gingivitis, and non-pathogenic plaque had never been observed. So uh, it states again that uh, part of indigenous uh, microbiota, okay, uh, but when a certain quantity amount of a plaque, because of that a quantity of a plaque was developed, the, this certain indigenous microorganisms um, has a specificity to cause a disease. It's not about uh, finding a non-pathogenic plaque, uh, uh, at that time. So they, they cause at least gingivitis, okay, but without maybe developing a periodontitis. And that's why this explains why some people have gingivitis for a whole lifetime without a progression to a periodontitis. And it's depending on the host ability, actually. But at this level, no, no, pre no previous uh, hypothesis, and even this one, uh, try to uh, explain the role of the host uh, in terms of the pathogenesis. Uh, taking into account that differences in the plaque microbial composition could lead to differences in the pathogenic potentials. So some people, uh, because of that composition of dental plaque uh, composition, leading to the variances uh, at the level of the disease uh, entity, uh, whether gingivitis or even going more progress to a periodontitis condition. So uh, uh, after the non-updated one, uh, Marsh, Philip Marsh in 1994 uh, came to have a very revolutionary uh, idea and very uh, great and uh, have an, a great impact about to, uh, to understand the composition of the dental plaque in relation to periodontal disease. He just to try to explain uh, the effect of the plaque uh, according to the uh, ecological uh, environmental insults and effect. Uh, actually, it's just combining the previous uh, hypothesis 
and it, 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 he claims that the imbalance of the total microflora due to uh, ecological stress uh, resulting to enrichment of the some microbial pathogens or disease-related microorganisms over others. And uh, the changes in the ecological stress, uh, for example, slides the lack of presence of certain nutrients, certain cofactors, pH, and the redox potential. The redox potential is that uh, indicator of the oxygen level, whether increase or decrease within the uh, dental plaque. So he just tried very simply tried to explain that the effect of the influence of the environment has a very great influence and impact uh, on the composition of dental plaque and how the plaque composition was changed uh, between the uh, um, uh, from the common cell or near normal equilibrium to the to the uh, pathogenic one by the effect of those environments. So he he gave just a great. Uh, value and importance to the effect of the ecological and environment uh, other than other causes. For example, uh, frequent exposure, exposure to a low pH, when, when I said a low pH, this is the indicator of the acidic environment. There's a huge acidity the, within the dental plaque. A frequent exposure to, to a low pH, for instance, uh, because of the uh, result of the uh, uh, sugar fermentation, leads to a relative increase of acid tolerant species. The acid tolerant species, for example, like um, Actinobus uh, lactobacillus mutans and lactobacilli. So those acid tolerants was when increase, leading to the more uh, sugar fermentation and more sugar fermentation and the acidic going more increase, uh, leading to the uh, what we call dental case. And I'm saying all of the experiment uh, try to explain this at the level of dental case and then we could implement this to the understanding of periodontal disease. And again, the prevention, in order to stop this process, this process can be prevented by interfering with the process that break down this relationship by, for example, using the non-fermentable sweetener that uh, prevent acidification. So when we, when we prevent and stop the acidification process, the whole process will stop. Uh, Marsh also uh, uh, not affecting the uh, not ex try to explain this uh, effect of the environment on the microbiota, but also the reverse effect of the microbiota to the environment. For example, the uh, primary colonizer of the early aerobic streptococci, for example, they use the most available uh, found oxygen in the environment because uh, it is aerobic. So when they use non-oxygen and part of the metabolic interaction, metabolism uh, activity of those microorganisms, they change the environment from aerobic to the anaerobic as the level of CO2 uh, increased. So this newly uh, anaerobic environment lead to encourage and support the survival and growth of the second colonizer afterward, uh, like it is, uh, uh, strict, uh, the strictly anaerobic uh, microorganisms involving, especially in the subgingival a plaque uh, uh, environment. Uh, so this will lead to the lower the redox potential, giving strict anaerobic a chance to settle and multiply within the biofilm. Again, it was limited this theory because it not uh, it, it, uh, there is no giving consideration to the uh, role of the genetic effect uh, of the host, and specifically the host, uh, for example, and the host uh, uh, significantly contribute to the composition of dental plaque and so susceptibility to, to disease. So the latest uh, theory that originated at uh, uh, 2012 by Haji Jindal's group uh, tried to combine and to understand all the previous uh, uh, hypotheses and just to summarize on giving uh, the new information about uh, the, uh, the level of the certain uh, low abundance, uh, this, uh, the, uh, dysbiotic microorganisms that found a very, in very low number, but it has the ability, it has the keystone ability to change the whole common cell and the uh, normal uh, inhabitant microorganisms to be dysbiotic and pathogenic one. So uh, also uh, it can be derived from the basic ecological studies because the, the influence on the effect of the environment is still active. Uh, the, also, the uh, non-specifically about the quantity and also the specific about the quality and certain specific microorganisms. But the new information that the Hajjin Gallis add on this theory is that he said that those specific, not uh, not every specific has a role to, do, to initiate a disease, but within that specific environment of the microbiology, 
there was a certain, a very keystone, a very important uh, keystone pathogen has a level, uh, has a, uh, found in low limber, uh, low abundance has the ability to uh, change the entire uh, common cell microorganism to be a pathogenic dysbiotic one. And he just described it uh, uh, following two pathways of understanding of this one. Uh, the first one, the by direct effect of those uh, keystone pathogen uh, to the uh, other bacteria just to, to, to cause dysbiosis, and also by indirect way by meaning of immune modulation. And I try to explain these three or two theories, uh, two pathways in a minute. Okay, so by doing so, the, this keystone pathogen uh, not only ensure its own survival and growth, but also affecting the whole uh, microbial community. First of all, just to try to explain why it, this theory uh, is called keystone and what the meaning of the keystone. Keystone, uh, uh, the basic definition in English, the key is representing the main or the principles or the major one. Understand everyone know the meaning of the stone. So as uh, you see in this picture, there's an arch of these stones. And in the middle, here in the center of that arch, they have, we have an a, a orange or brown uh, stone found in the middle. So just imagine if you remove this one, the whole arch will fall down. And if we just apply this understanding of this arch and the keystone in every model of our lives, uh, in our uh, socials, uh, uh, wildlife, even in the wild loss in the animal kingdom, um, uh, in everything, uh, we have a, a, a tremendous examples of these keystones in our life. Uh, as a family, uh, I can't, we, nobody can imagine that the, the family, routine family, uh, the, the environments can go and just keep going on without the role on the keystone role of the father or mother and the family that miss one of them uh, they just try to uh, accommodate into the new situation of missing the keystone one but definitely this will affecting uh, everything in their life uh, also in the uh, uh, wildlife uh, uh, keystone understandings, there's a lot of the keystone animals. Without them, the uh, whole related uh, environments could be affected. And one example of this is a beaver. The beaver has a very keystone effect when it survives within that uh, um, uh, waterfalls, uh, wetlands, uh, specific areas that the keystone, uh, these beavers, when exist, it's affecting the uh, a lot of uh, uh, bird, uh, for example, bird uh, uh, nesting environments and creation of the wetland ecosystem, and increasing the waterfalls. The population also, as the as the here we can see, the fishes environment and population will exist, uh, and this is by uh, effect of the purification of the waters that the beavers exist uh, by its ability just to uh, uh, move in the tail. You have a very large white tail so when he just moving that tail within that uh, water uh, so uh, just like kind of the purification of the, uh, of the whole environments and after that the whole fishes uh, population within that environment is coming to live here uh, nesting cells of birds they, because uh, you know this part of the um, nesting environments for itself it just it, uh, can create a lot of nests that the birds could uh, penetrate from uh, also build uh, certain dams on the rivers and this will protect a certain uh, creatures equalizing here uh, that is uh, survived so uh, without beaver all of the related animals could not survive within that environment uh, without the beaver helping or assistance and as i'm saying there's a tremendous examples of the keystone modifiers so if uh, hydrogen gallus is to try to, uh, uh, to apply this uh, understanding in the uh, world of the microbiology, and if the microbiology really have a certain keystone, this will definitely have an uh, uh, implement, uh, could uh, uh, help in to understanding the compositions of the structure of the microbial community that interplay with the host and their environment. In human, uh, nowadays, there's a lot of interest to uh, uh, try to interest to elucidate and just to explain both the mechanisms that maintain the host microbial hemostasis of the mucosal surface, and also the mechanism that disturb this hemostatic balance leading to the dysbiosis and the initiation of inflammatory disease. Keystone microorganisms that support and stabilize the microbiota 
associated with the disease uh, can call on uh, honorably uh, uh, named as the keystone pathogen. Uh, differences in the composition of the microbiota microbiota and health and disease uh, could be inter interpreted in two ways. Either because the presence of a direct effect of the specific bacteria on the novel species of those uh, periodontal pathogens that are given to the etiology of periodontitis that, was, well, that were not uh, persist or barely found in a healthy state, or by using a dysbiosis of the periodontal microbiota leading to alteration in the host microbial cross stock sufficient to initiate inflammatory disease. On this keystone, actually uh, uh, tried to favor this point, keystone hypothesis, because of the dysbiosis uh, uh, attributed to the effect of the uh, keystone pathogen effect. Uh, so, of the keystone pathogen was found, there's a, a lot of benefits in terms of the um, uh, treatment and the diagnosis of periodontal disease. Uh, definitely, there's a novel treatment could be applied to and the polymicrobial or complex dysbiotic disease and the development of novel targeted diagnostic tools of a complex polymicrobial disease shown to be driven by a keystone pathogen, definitely. Uh, could be applied the keystone in periodontal uh, pathogenesis to certain uh, microorganisms over other. Uh, actually, uh, the keystone pathogen hypothesis uh, was firstly tested on the uh, uh, ability of the performance in Javaris, one of the red complex, according to the screening complexes, red complex uh, the, the microbiota, a strictly anaerobic cocobacilli bacteria that found in the deep subgingival uh, environment. And this being uh, if it is, could be a keystone pathogen, it will lead to a tremendous uh, shift and change in the understanding of those etiology uh, of the microbial, uh, sorry, periodontal disease uh, in relation to microbiology. Uh, evidence of this transforming the normally the symbiotic microbiotic uh, dysbiotic uh, state uh, leading to the breakdown of the normal hemostatic relationship with the host, as I'm said. Uh, the, so the P. gingivalis they, has shown to evolve the sophisticated actually strategies to evade or subvert the component of the host immune systems by meaning of total like resemblance or complement. Rather than act directly as the pro-inflammatory bacterium, it could act directly, to be honest, but the, uh, the, the way, the indirect way that P. gingivalis like to do uh, by using immune modulation, and, and that, that uh, clarified the meaning of immune, immune modulation that I just talked um, in a few minutes ago. So if this species and virus do that, this leading to the impaired innate immunity, and if the innate immunity was in, impaired, this leading to alter uh, the growth and development of the entire biofilm. So the quantity and the quality at that time will change, and uh, triggering a destructive changes in the normal hemostatic host microbial interplay. A uh, very low colonization was found of P. gingivalis less than 0.01% leading to alteration in the number and organization of the oral commensal. And you just imagine how this uh, a very uh, minute number and very low abundance number of P. gingivalis leading to the shifting of the oral commensal bacteria in the germ-free mouse model leading to periodontitis. And this is the basic uh, diagram of the one of the uh, mechanisms that P. gingival is acting as a keystone pathogen leading to this biotic or microbiota and uh, initiating periodontitis. So uh, uh, by the meaning of gingipane, one of the variance factors, cysteine proteinase of the P. gingivalis, leading to convert the C5 complement by the classical pathway to the C5A. And the C5A, uh, when it's accumulated on the surface of the cells, leading to act, uh, accumulation of that receptors and the binding with the C5A uh, in, co in, co in coordination with the TOLAC receptors, leading to inflammation on le uh, leukocyte killing, decreasing leukocyte killing, uh, uh, so leading to the uh, increased number of the common cell to the, to, and shifted to the dysbiotic or microbiota, and leading to more activation of complement uh, dependent inflammation on bone loss. At uh, this level, if we uh, try to uh, antagonize that receptors by a certain inhibition of the uh, binding of the C5A to that receptors uh, uh, using the antagonist, the whole process will stop and the normal common cell return to normal uh, proportion and everything will change. 
The period in which failed to cause dysbiosis and periodontitis if the, uh, uh, there was no common cell microbiota because the PDG virus depends on the common cell to be uh, uh, actually. And also the, if there is no certain host receptors that the PDG virus act with, okay, uh, to just to subvert the leukocyte defenses. And if the bacterium lack the enzymatic activity to cause leukocyte subversion. Besides the, uh, uh, all, uh, yeah, um, as I'm said within that diagram, the covert is enzyme activity, C5A, activating receptors uh, with the TOLAC receptor 2, and this causing immune modulation subversion, enhanced inflammation, and repair leukocyte killing capacity. Also, there's uh, uh, the immune modulation, the indirect way, could be uh, activated by certain enzymes. Uh, for example, uh, the typical lipopolysaccharide, one of the variance factors of the BDN virus. Uh, leading to antagonizing TL, TL, TLR for TOLAC receptor 4, causing immune, sub, immune sub suppression. And also, PGN virus has CERB, serine phosphatase B, that inhibit the synthesis of interleukin 8. And we know that interleukin 8, one of the most important chemoattractant cytokine that uh, uh, chemo, uh, leading to the uh, neutrophil recruitment to the sites of the infection. So, if there's inhibition of interleukin 8, this will lead to the local chemokine paralysis, paralysis we, we call it. If the paralysis exists, this will lead to uncontrolled growth of other species in the same biofilm, and this is enhanced the complement dependent destructive inflammation, leading to more tissue breakdowns like heme and integrated proteins. And if this is, exists, this will lead to transition of a disease provoking microbiota such as a proteolytic and a secretic bacteria. So uh, the Hutchinson has tried to explain how this shifting exists uh, at the mechanistic level, at the molecular level, uh, by all of this uh, uh, the flow diagram. So to summarize, uh, PS, uh, uh, some of the PGN virus virulence effects uh, to cause a shifting between symbiotic dysbiotics, uh, immune subversion by interleukin ACE inhibition, complement subversion, anti-LR antagonism, causing impaired host defense. This will affect the symbiotic, dysbiotic, and changing the uh, tissue health status between, from health toward periodontal disease. PGN virus also exit a direct way by, uh, as a bacterium, as a virulent bacterium, and other bacterium by a host independent without the role of the host. So they found that uh, when they, int they introduced PGN virus in a healthy multi-species biofilm, this will alter the pattern of the community gene expression, and we call the gene expression responsible for the virulence of the uh, bacteria, like the genes related to the growth and division, uh, transport system, putative response paralysis, and transcription factors. Uh, uh, the, uh, the, this uh, diagram tried to also explain in, uh, in the uh, loop uh, model uh, how to exert the inflammatory uh, uh, influence uh, on the uh, dysbiotic microorganisms when it's using PG, using immune suppression and uh, subversion by using complement activation, impairing the host defense to dysbiotic microbiota. Uh, the dysbiotic microbiota leading to enhance another enhance of complement activation. So this. So the, the continuity of the complement activation came from the first insult of the PG as the keystone on the dysbiotic microorganism. So the continuity of this loop will lead to advanced periodontal destruction. In addition to that inflammation leading to the bone resorption and both of them leading to the, another uh, encouragement and uh, support the dysbiotic microbiota living within the uh, uh, site of infection. This is the final diagram try to explain uh, uh, or to try to combining the whole non-specific ecological and keystone pathology hypothesis in a, in a very simple diagram. So accumulation of bacteria as a part of the plaque leading to increasing inflammatory mediators and the gingival inflammation and increasing all the GCF, gingival cubicle fluid leakage. At the first level, if we remove this uh, science meat inhibition, so if we remove the, uh, remove the dental plaque by using oral hygiene practices, the whole process will stop. So just imagine, it's very easy just to practice the uh, tooth brushing uh, the correct way just to uh, uh, stop the whole process. But if you, do, you don't do that, the uh, gingival inflammation will continue leading to increasing the protein and iron part, as part of the GCF leakage. 
and this will lead to increasing the proteolytic bacteria and activation keystone uh, pathogen mechanisms, uh, which is a stop, which could be stopped at this level by locking of the keystone pathogen. So if the pathogen, keystone pathogen, hit it at this step, the continuity of the whole process was stopped. At this level, the increased proteolytic bacteria and the dysbiotic one leading to increase in inflammatory mediated on the uh, pro-inflammatory loop will continue at the, uh, this uh, 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 by this way. Uh, this uh, uh, increased inflammation and mediators also could be inhibited by removing removal by oral hygiene, uh, increasing the host capacity to clear involved bacteria on health associated or promote or health promoting bacteria. Uh, could lead to an increase uh, to uh, equal of equalify or equalize sorry the uh, inflammatory uh, process uh, return to the normal one. Uh, also, this inflammatory mediator it exists leading to an increased amount of activation of the immune cells responsible in the adaptive immunity. Uh, uh, more uh, frequently, at the exposure of that is in the increased risk of periodontitis development. So this cycle, just to summarize very simply, the whole uh, uh, theories uh, in terms of the microbial host interaction. So uh, the removal of oral hygiene and lack of keystone pathogen at different levels will definitely stop the whole process and return to normal. Uh, this is, I tried just to, uh, to be honest, this lecture have a lot of information, but uh, according to your understand, under, as undergraduate student and your understanding level, actually, I just tried to summarize it by this way. Uh, and everyone have questions, I'm ready just to answer it by, um, in the, on your page in Google Classroom, or if you can attend in our department in person, I can, uh, help you just to understand if anything vague or difficult to understand. Uh, so today I just finished the uh, to my two lectures of the plaque and plaque hypothesis, hoping to meet you next week um, to start with the pathogenesis of the periodontal disease, and after that the host bacterial interactions in some details. Till that time, uh, thank you so much for your kind attention and listening. And I appreciate your uh, listening and attendance. Uh, so see you next time. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.